Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Brother Brett. And I'd like to ask you to turn in your Bibles this morning to the ninth chapter of the book of Romans as we begin. Lord, our, our message this morning as we begin, we've been studying all the way from the first verse, first chapter of Romans, verse by verse, all the way to the place we are now. A couple of uh, Sundays ago, we were um, in the eighth chapter. We finished the study of the eighth chapter. And Paul was teaching us there about the perfect eternal security of the salvation that Christ has given to us. Nothing can ever undo it. You understand what I'm saying this morning? Your salvation that Christ has given you, nothing can ever undo it. No one can ever uh, take it away. It is unbreakable and irreversible. Paul began that chapter, Romans chapter 8, by saying, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And he ended that chapter by saying that nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that is the theme of Romans chapter 8, from the very first word all the way down to the very last word. We can never be lost once we're saved. We can never be lost. And that is wonderful news for a Christian. Amen. As we come to Romans chapter 9, and as we're looking through Romans 9, 10, and 11, we're going to see that the news is not so good for the nation of Israel. Because so many of them, the reason is not because they're saved and they're going to be lost. The reason is that they're lost, they've never been saved. So many of them. And last Sunday morning, we began looking at the very beginning of Romans 9, the first few verses, and Paul was talking there about how badly his heart was broken for them. Romans 9 and 2, look at it with me. It says, he says, I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. His heart was broken because so many of his Israelite brethren were lost. Do you have a broken heart for lost people? Paul did. He knew that around him were people who did not know Jesus every day and his heart was broken. The really sad thing about that is these were some of the most religious people on planet earth. And all their religion could not save them. It was that very religion they were clinging to which was keeping them from coming to Christ to be saved. And Paul's heart was broken for them. As we studied a little further last Sunday, we were reading where Paul was expressing a very deep love that he had in his heart for the people of Israel. And he made an amazing statement there in verse number 3, in Romans 9 and 3. Paul said, I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. That's how badly Paul's heart was broken for them. That's how deeply Paul loved them. Can you imagine loving someone so much that you'd be willing to be a curse from Christ, that you'd be willing to go to hell forever if you could save that person by doing that? Of course, Paul knew he couldn't do that. Paul knew, I hope you're listening this morning, Paul knew he didn't have the ability to do that. But he said there, I would do that if I could. I would do that if I could. And that's a deep love Paul had for his people. So in the first few verses of Romans chapter 9, Paul's talking about how much he loves his people. Before he gets into this matter, the fact that so many of them are lost and have rejected Christ, he just expresses his love for his people. But as we study through the next few verses of our text this morning. As we go through the next few verses, we're going to see that Paul is going to be talking about how much God loves his people, Israel. And so I want you to look at verse 3 now this morning, and we're going to continue on down through verse 5. Let's look at it together. Paul says, For I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites 
To whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, this morning we come before you and we just seek your presence to come and be in our midst, Lord, today. Lord, we're not just here as a ritual, but we want to come and meet with you. We pray, Father, that you speak to us through your word and teach us today. Forgive us where we've sinned. Lord, if there's anybody here that does not yet know Jesus as Savior, we pray, Father, today that they would. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Paul has good reason. He has a lot of reason to grieve, to be brokenhearted for his people his brethren, his countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. He has a lot of reason, and it is at the heart of our text this morning. Paul has good reason to be brokenhearted over the fact that his own people are lost because they had so much opportunity. They had more opportunity than any other people on earth, and they totally rejected it. This was Israel, God's people, and God gave them more gifts God gave them greater gifts than any other nation on earth, and they turned away from it, and they threw it all away. And I want to take you through this this morning. I want to show you all these gifts God blessed Israel with. Paul shows them to us here in these verses, and, and I want to show you all these gifts God blessed them with. And the really sad thing is they just threw it all away when it came to Christ. So first this morning, we're going to look, if you're following along in your notes, you can look at the back of your bulletin, you'll see the first point is the adoption. That's the first gift that God gave to Israel. In verse 4, the second part of verse 4, uh, Paul says, They are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption. I think about little Moses out there in that little basket of bulrushes that his mother made him and she just to save his life from the Egyptians who were killing the Hebrew children she put him in that little basket sealed with pitch and put him out there into the river and the Pharaoh's daughter was out there bathing and she and she sent one of her servants out there to get it and she brought the little baby back to her and she looked upon that little baby and the baby wept and the Bible tells us that she had compassion for that little child because the baby wept and what she did was she adopted little Moses into her house the Pharaoh's daughter see she knew this was one of the little Hebrew slaves but she had compassion because the baby wept and she with that compassion adopted that little baby and raised him as her own son compassion it is compassion that has caused the Lord to give Israel the adoption now we as we've already read in our study of Romans, we receive the spirit of adoption whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. And that comes to us individually, but God adopted Israel as a nation. The Scripture tells us that. God said, I want this people to be my people. In Exodus 4 and 22, He said, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Hosea 11, uh, the Lord said, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I have called my son. And they were chosen by God as a special nation to have a special relationship with God. And they were given his blessing and his care and his help and his power would be displayed through the people of Israel. And uh, we as individuals call God our father, but Israel as a nation were adopted into a relationship where God chose to be their father. They were uniquely set apart as a nation to bear witness to all the world, and all the world could look at them and know that the God of Israel is the true God because of all the things God did for and through them. Isaiah in the midst of Israel. Did he dwell in the midst of any other nation like he dwelt in the midst of Israel? Do you remember when Moses went up into Mount Sinai to receive the law from the Lord? Let's look at the scripture real quick if you hold your place in Romans, but turn back to Exodus chapter 20. And I want to read to you what the scripture says about when the Lord came and gave the law to 
to Moses there on Mount Sinai when Moses went up there. And the Bible says, Exodus 20 and verse number 18. If you're there, say amen. All right. It says, all the people witnessed the thunderings and the lightning flashes. Now, that's enough to keep me in the house. Lightning and thunder, you're not going to catch me running around outside, okay? Because I got more sense than that. And people say to me, are you scared of a little lightning? Well, yeah, you better believe it. Have you ever seen it hit the ground? Have you ever seen it hit somebody? I don't want what little hair I have burned off the top of my head. But they saw the thunderings and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet. Oh, I look forward to the sound of another trumpet one day, right? The Lord comes with the sound of a trumpet and the mountain smoking. Boy, I'm glad they didn't catch me smoking. But the mountain was smoking. It was, it was like it was on fire, smoke. And when the people saw it, they trembled and they stood afar off. And then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear. But let not God speak with us lest we die. And so it was a powerful presence that caused the children of Israel to fear. It's that glorious presence of God, mighty, holy, and awesome. And he revealed himself in the midst of Israel. The Bible tells us that when Moses had finished the building of the tabernacle in, over in Exodus 40, just about 20 chapters over, the Bible tells us when he had finished constructing that tabernacle, the Bible says in Exodus 40 and verse 34, then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle the children of Israel would go onward in their journeys but if the cloud was not taken up then they did not journey till the day that it was taken it up and that same glory also filled the house the tabernacle that's the temple that Solomon built in his day in first Kings chapter 8 and verse 10 the word of God says the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord no other nation on earth did God choose to manifest his presence in such a way and to all the nations of the world, it was clear that God dwelt in the midst of Israel. So he not only adopted them into his family, but he dwelt among them in his glorious, glorious presence right there among them. The third thing we see in our text are the covenants. That's the third gift God gave to Israel. And verse number four continues Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, and the covenants. And there was an, the Abrahamic covenant, uh, which was recorded in Genesis chapter 12. And it was repeated and confirmed in such a great way in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 17. By the way, if you hear something about Israel in the news and all the people that want them to give up land, it's their land. God gave it to Israel. God gave it to Israel. And it's, it's all the way back in Genesis 12, 15, and 17. There was the Mosaic Covenant contained in, 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 in uh, Exodus chapter 19, recorded in, in, the, in Exodus 19, and it's contained in the law as you study through that Exodus 19 all the way down through chapter 31. And then it's repeated again in Deuteronomy 29 and 30. There was also the Davidic Covenant for King David, which was recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 7. God did wonderful things through these covenants. God pledged to make Israel a nation through Abraham. He pledged to bless them above all other nations through Moses. He pledged to give them an eternal kingdom through David. And do other nations on earth, Noah, do any other nations on earth have these same covenants of Israel? Did, did God do anything like this? Now we do enter into these covenants as Christians today by faith. But these covenants were given to Israel first. And it is through God's kindness to Israel that these blessings still come to us today. So thank God for Israel and for what God has done through them. Amen. Amen. Fourthly, we have the giving of the law. The giving of the law. In verse 4 there, a little further, it says, to, to Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law. God 
gave Moses the Ten Commandments on tablets of stones when he went up into the mountain. And the Lord himself spoke with Moses and gave him the statutes and the ordinances. And he told him that Israel would be blessed if they were obedient to him. Deuteronomy chapter 28, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, It shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will, ble- will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. God said it's, you're going to be blessed. It's going to be good with you if you're obedient to my commandments. A little later in Deuteronomy 28 and verse 15, the Lord says, But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all His commandments and His statutes, which I command you today, all these curses will come upon you and will overtake you. Sounds kind of like the way my mama raised me. She said, if you obey me, life's going to be good. If you disobey me, I'm going to kill you. She about half did it many times. I don't know how you half kill somebody, but my mother managed to do it. And so the law was a guide for Israel. And it showed them the difference between the paths of blessing and cursing. And it showed them the difference between the paths of life and death. But do you know something else that's even more important about the law that the law did? God gave the law to Israel, not just to teach them right and wrong, God gave the law to Israel to teach them about His own holiness. You look into that law. When any person, including an Israelite, looks into the perfect law of God, it reveals two things very quickly. God is holy, first of all. Second of all, I'm a sinner. I have failed to meet up to God's holy standard. That's why Paul said in Romans 3.20, which we studied months back, that therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law, the Ten Commandments, all those 600 plus laws that you read about in the Old Testament, they are there to show us that we are sinners. And it is a picture of God's holiness. And that's why Israel had the law. That law God gave to Israel was designed to humble our sinful hearts and bring us down to our knees in the presence of a holy God seeking his mercy and his forgiveness that's what the law is for fifthly God gave them the service the service of God there at the end of verse four Israelites to whom pertain the adoption the glory the covenants the giving of the law and the service of God now what is that what is the service of of God. Well, that's talking about the ceremonial services. It, it includes all the sacrifices, the cleansings, uh, the priesthood, the Levites, everything that went on up at the tabernacle. And what was this service meant to do? Well, it, means, it was a means for the people so that they could come into God's presence and find forgiveness and find mercy through sacrifice and to have peace with God. That was why the tabernacle was there. That was why the altar was there. That's why sacrifice was made so that sin could be atoned and so that people could have forgiveness and be made at peace with God. And it's very appropriate in my thinking. It's very interesting that Paul spoke of the service right here right after he spoke of the giving of the law. Because the law could never bring anyone to God. The law simply brings us to the place where we need, we know that we need God's mercy and we need to be brought into God's presence. And so when the law has accomplished that work in our hearts, then the Lord provides, the Lord takes over and provides that way that he can bring us into his presence, that mercy for us that we need. And he does that through sacrifice. The service of God, where blood, the blood of a lamb was poured out and offered up to God to atone for our sins. And this service provided for the Israelites both temporal remission. Remember that, that, that old tabernacle, that the blood of those bulls and goats did not really take away sin, but it rolled back those sins as they looked forward to the real sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so it provided a temporal uh, place of mercy that they could come to uh, 
for remission of sins, but it also provided a prophetic foreshadowing of the coming Christ, the Messiah, who would become the Lamb of God by laying down His own life as a sacrifice on Calvary for our sins. Amen? Aren't you glad we have that? That's what the service was. All those sacrifices made at the temple. And then we have the promises, number six, the promises. And don't get this confused with the covenants because he's already talked about the covenants and he says, mentions these promises separately. But I believe, you say, what, what does this mean? I believe the promises refers to everything that God prophetically promised beforehand in his word concerning the coming Messiah. Ever since sin came into the world and, and, and men were cursed by the curse of sin and death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Ever since sin entered the world, God began promising that he would send a Messiah. All the way back to Genesis 3 and 15, he said he would send, send the seed of the woman to bruise the head of the serpent. And that is a prophetic statement about how Christ would overturn the work of Satan and would defeat the work of Satan. God has been promising that ever since sin came into the world. And there are many of these kinds of promises in the scripture that we could look at this morning, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to take you to one right now. I'd like you to take you to Psalm 2. And so hold your place in Romans, but Psalm 2 and verse number 7. We could read quite a bit of this psalm, but I'm only going to read a little bit of it. He said, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. God said, you are my son. So this is a, a, a scripture. This Old Testament scripture is clearly referring to the son of who? God, the son of God. And as we consider these words from the Old Testament, by the way, when you go down a little further in, in Psalm, you go all the way down to the end of Psalm 2, it says, blessed are those who trust in him. Blessed are those who trust. It says, kiss the son lest he be angry with you. It's time for us to surrender at the feet of the one that's spoken about in the second Psalm, and that's Jesus. But as we think about these words from the Old Testament, I'd also like you to turn to Acts 13. Acts 13 and verse 32. Because this is where Paul begins to preach in the book of Acts. In Acts 13 and verse 32. After he's been saved. Not very long after he's been saved. And I want you to listen to the words the Apostle Paul spoke. Because he refers back to this second psalm. I want you to listen to what he says about it. Acts 13, 32 and 33. If you're there, say amen. amen. Alright. Here's what he says. He says, we declare to you glad tidings that promise. You see that? That promise, which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled for us, their children. You hear that? There's a promise made to the fathers. And God has fulfilled it for us, their children. In that he raised up who? Jesus. He raised up Jesus. As it, also, as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And so Paul quotes from that psalm. Showing us that it's clearly identified. It's, he clearly identifies the words of Psalm 2 as a prophetic promise that's been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And many promises like that in the Old Testament, which we can find, which give the promise of a Savior coming. Now, these promises, why? Why are they important? Let me tell you why they're important. You, you see, the covenants, they were great. The covenants are very important and they're very great because they set Israel apart as a nation, but they could never make the Israelites right with God. And the law uh, was great for the Israelites because it, it could reveal God's holiness to Israel, but it could never make men holy. And the ceremonial service, it was great too. It, it, it really gave them a a, a great prophetic picture looking forward to Christ and it provided temporary, temporary mercy and forgiveness for them and access to God. But that ceremonial service was never enough to do this for all time with Israel. And so when all these other things that God gave them in the Old Testament was not quite enough to do it, God gave them a promise of something better. 
You understand that? God gave them a promise of something better that could. They needed a promise of something much greater. And that promise was a promise, every promise, that concerns the Lord Jesus Christ in his coming as our Messiah, as our Savior, to save us. And God gave that to Israel. Seventhly, we have the fathers. The fathers. And in verse 5, as we get into verse 5, the beginning of verse 5, it says, Of whom are the fathers? The Israelites are of the fathers. They descended down from the fathers. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. These are the men God made covenant with. And they are the ones who walk by faith. Genesis 15, 6 says that Abraham believed in the Lord and God accounted it to him for righteousness. And Romans eleven twenty eight 28 tells us that concerning election, it says, we're going to find that in a few uh, weeks, maybe a few months. We'll see how long it takes me to get there. But in Romans eleven twenty eight, 28, it says concerning election that the Israelites are beloved for the sake of the fathers. In other words, God's love for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and David and all these men, it was so great that he loves Israel through them and because of them and, and, and the covenant he made with them. And God continues to love Israel because of all that. And even today, the people of Israel are very quick to claim Abraham as their father, and they always have been. The Israelites were very blessed to have these men as their patriarchs because they showed them how to walk by faith. And then finally this morning, we have the Christ. That's the final gift that God gave. And it says, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. And if you want to thank God for anything that's ever come out of Israel, this should be the biggest thing right here. Christ came through Israel. That's why we should bless Israel. That's why we should be thankful for that nation. Because God sent His Son through them. The gospel came through them. And church, Christ is the highest, best gift that God ever gave to the Israel. The adoption was good because God chose them and placed His fatherly care upon them as a nation. The glory was good because God Himself dwelt in the midst of them in such a way that both they and all the nations of the world knew that there is no God like the God of Israel. The covenants were good because God pledged to make them a great nation and an eternal kingdom. The law was good because not only did it teach them the difference between life and death, but it also revealed to them the perfect holiness of God and it drove them down onto their knees seeking His mercy and His salvation. And the service of God was good because it gave them much needed place to find mercy and be brought into the presence of God and, and it gave them a prophetic knowledge of the coming Messiah. The fathers were good because they showed the Israelites how to walk by faith. And the covenants were for the father's sake. All these things good. But listen, all those gifts God gave to Israel, even when you put them all together, were not enough to save a single soul. So, in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Isn't that good? And all the rest of it wasn't enough. God gave the one gift that was enough. After everything God had done for Israel, on top of all that, He sent Christ. And of Christ, whom the Father sent, Paul finishes out the fifth verse talking about Christ, whom the Father sent. And he says these words, he says that He is overall, He is overall the eternally blessed God. A clear statement of Christ's divinity. Christ is God. Overall, the eternally blessed God. Amen. God Himself came down and dwelt among men. And He did this amongst the people of Israel. They saw it. They had a front row seat to it. But the tragedy, the really sad thing is, this is why Paul's heart is broken, 
Israel rejected Christ. And they threw everything away. Just like Joseph and his brothers. Remember Joseph came to them? Now, if somebody had gone to Joseph's brothers and said, guys, there's going to be a famine that's going to affect all the earth. And everybody's going to need food. People are going to have to travel to far places to try to find food. You're going to be dirt poor. And it's going to be a lack. There's going to be drought. There's going to be no, no, no harvest. And, and you're going to suffer. It's going to be a terrible famine. And if somebody had come to the Israelites, the Joseph's brothers, and they had said, but God is raising up a deliverer who's going to be able to help you. And he's going to be able to provide for you a place to live where there'll be plenty of food for you to eat for years and years to come. And your family's going to be saved because of that deliverer. Joseph's brothers would have said, man, that's great. That is, that is wonderful news. But that's not the way it was communicated to them. It was communicated in a little different way. Joseph came along and he said, check out the new coat daddy gave me. And it was a coat of many colors and it said that their father loved him very much. And they, none of those other guys got a coat. And he said, hey, check out my dreams that I had. Uh, we were out in the field and we were binding sheaves and uh, all your sheaves bowed down to my sheaves. And uh, his brothers started getting a little aggravated with Joseph. And they said, you know what? Uh, we can't stand your dreams, Joseph. And we can't stand your rainbow coat, Joseph. And we can't stand your face, Joseph. And so they rejected their brother and they put him in a pit. But all their hatred and their despise, their despite of Joseph um, did not undo the fact that one of these days they would have to come back into his presence and he was going to be that deliverer. And of course, when they did come back into his presence, we know the end of the story that Joseph said, don't be afraid. He could have really, I mean, he did kind of play with the situation for a little while. I think it's kind of funny to watch some of the things Joseph did. He, he hung them out there on a string for a little while. But eventually Joseph said, don't be afraid. He said, because I know you meant this for evil, but God meant it we're good. Amen? Amen? Amen. If Israel had got off their little high horses, so many of these Israelites who were stuck on their old, their old ways of their religion, which they felt made them righteous. And if they could get that past that idea of their own righteousness and realize that Christ is the righteous one, and only through him can we have real righteousness. But they wouldn't give up that idea of their own righteousness. And so they couldn't stand Jesus. And they couldn't stand the truth that he told them. And, he couldn't, and so they rejected him. And they crucified him. But God had a plan. Had Israel not rejected him and crucified him, somebody had to do it. Had they not done it, Christ had, would not have gone to the cross and died for the world. And so we're going to see, as we continue, how God used that. And though many of the Israelites meant it for evil, God meant it for good. God meant it for good. God's plan was masterful. Sometimes we don't even know what we're doing when we're trying to do what we do. But God has a plan. And he used it to bring Christ to the cross to be the Savior of us all. And one day, we're all going to come back into his presence. Don't throw away what God has provided for you. Don't throw it away. We ought to be thankful for what God has done. God has put you in a church, and I'm not the best Bible teacher, but He's put you in a church where there is a passion for teaching the Bible word for word. And that's what we do when we come here. We open the Bible, and we don't skip a verse, okay? And I can't tell you what every verse in this Bible means, but I'll study it out the best I can, and I'll do the best I can, and I'll pray, and I'll depend on God, what I don't know how to do. But you are in a church where the Bible is going to be taught to you every week, and you ought to be thankful because that is a gift. That is a gift. You are in a church where people love you and care about you. We care about 
your families. We care about your children. Our church ought to be thankful for this building. It was built, you know, this building's 40 years old now. It doesn't look 40 years old, does it? Right? Neither do I, do I? <laughs> but we have a great facility that God's blessed us with. And right out here on this highway here, so easy to see. We ought to thank God for that because I've been in other churches where the location is junk. A lot of preachers would give their teeth for a building like this. They preach with false teeth the rest of their life for a building like this. In a location like this, we ought to be thankful for everything God's given us. We ought to be thankful that we have families. You're here this morning because God put you in a family, put you under some kind of influence where you realize, hey, I need to be in this place this morning. Don't throw away the gifts that God's given you. Be thankful. Be thankful for everything God's given you.